we're going to be in the book of Jonah. I'm not going to read the whole thing to you because we will read it as we walk through. But first, I'm going to tell you a story that my mom would always tell me to make fun of me. My mom loved me. Um, she would tell me to make fun of me as I was growing up because she thought it was hilarious. When I was in elementary school, um, I, ha- I remember, kind of, this is more my mom telling the story. She can admit it all up. I don't know. Um, but I remember um, my first crush, okay? Her name was Stephanie. I was in elementary school, um, and I remember telling my buddies, like, hey, I think I like Stephanie, right? And then my buddies did naturally what they would do. They went and talked to her friends, and they told her friends that I had a crush on Stephanie. And then what do you think her friends did? Yeah, they went and told Stephanie that I had a crush on her. And so word went backwards through Stephanie's friends to my friends to me that Stephanie also liked me. And so we had a mutual innocent elementary school crush on one another. Now, Stephanie also sent a message and said, hey, like, why don't you like, tell Colton to meet me at the merry-go-round at recess, okay? And I, that word got back to me, and at first I was excited. I was looking forward to recess. But as the day progressed on and the bell rang for recess, I started to freak out. Like, oh, my goodness, like, what am I doing? That's a girl. Like, I don't want to get near her, right? And so I began to get scared, and I was the last one to go out to recess, and I walked outside, and Stephanie was standing in the background, right? And she saw me, and she was excited. And so Stephanie began to, like, walk towards me. And now, naturally, you think, okay, so you would walk towards her and meet her at the merry ground, like you said you would. But what I did instead was look at her, be terrified, and run the opposite direction, okay? And began to sprint away from her, and you would think that she would just be disappointed and just go like, okay, whatever, he doesn't like me. No, no, no. This girl began to chase me, all right? (laughs) And chase me around the playground and pursue me. And then so much so that I began to juke her, like spin move away from her, until this little girl had to clothesline me in order to get me to stop, all right? So that was the story of my first crush. That relationship did not work out, um, which is God's sovereignty that I'm married to Katie. And so um, why do I tell you that story? Uh, Running and chasing, right? When I think of Jonah, I think of that um, in my life. And it was out of my insanity to run away. And it was out of her kindness that she chased me. And that's the story of Jonah. That You've got a prophet, a man of God, who runs from the Lord. And out of his kindness, out of the kindness of God, he chases Jonah. It's a story of Jonah, but it's also the story of our Bible. That from Genesis to Revelation, it's a story of humanity running from God and God continually pursuing us. Like, get that. We're going to talk about it a lot, but just at the front here, think about that. The reality that you have a God who pursues you who will do whatever it takes to get your attention to see that he is better than anything else. It's the story of Jonah. Out of his kindness, he sent his son to the world from from perfect heaven to broken earth and put on flesh, died the death that we couldn't die, rose from the grave. Like, that's how he pursued us. The gravity in which he went to make us his should make us fall flat on our face. And whatever circumstances you're walking in here with, that is truth that you can rest on. And the weight that you carry on your shoulders of trying to earn God's grace, or the guilt that you carry on your shoulders for the things that you've done, God's already taken it on himself. And so, let's start with Jonah chapter 1, starting in verse 1, and we will move fast. Um, It will be on the screen um, if you don't have your Bible, but I encourage you to look at your own copy of Scripture um, and follow along. Verse one, chapter 1, verse 1, it says, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. So the first question we're going to ask is, what's the deal with Nineveh? Because obviously Jonah does not want to go to Nineveh. Nineveh was the capital city of Assyria. And Assyrians were not just known in Israel, but they were known all among the world. And they were known for their arrogance, for their pride, for their absolutely brutality in war. Like, people told stories 
about the Assyrians. Here's an Assyrian king that described what they did in war. He says, many of the captives I burned in a fire, many I took alive. Uh, from some I cut off their hands to their wrists, from others I've cut off their noses, ears, and fingers. I put out the eyes of many of the soldiers. I burnt their young men and women to death. That was the reputation of the Assyrians. And so if you were a Jew, you hated the Assyrians. Like it was culturally normal for you to hate an entire group of people. There was a deep dislike for the Assyrians. And God comes to Jonah, a Jew, and he says, go. Go to Nineveh. What would be your response to that? A group of people that have hurt people you know. And God says, go. What's funny and interesting about this is that isn't that the story of the Bible? That there is a group of people that has offended God, rejected him, strategically and purposely offended him. And God sends who? His son. To go to that group of people and call them out of their sin into repentance to experience life. So in the very first verse, we get a picture of the gospel. (laughs) That God would send his son. Verse 3. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish um, from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa, found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down uh, down into it to go with him to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. Now, I'm going to give you six realities from the book of Jonah. Okay, And here's your first reality. Reality number one, though we were made by and for God, there is a tendency in us to resist and run from God. That we have a tendency to look at what God has offered us and say, no, thank you. The history of humanity is filled with the rejection of God. And so the big question here is, what is God going to do with Jonah? What is God going to do with us when we run? Verse four, but the Lord But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up. What does God do when people run? When his people run, he chases. And that's reality number two, that God will pursue his children. Now, here's the deal. Sometimes his means of pursuing isn't easy. In fact, sometimes his means of pursuing us can be very easy. Difficult, and in this moment, God introduces a storm in Jonah's life. And here's the encouragement God will not leave you to rot in your sin, (laughs) He won't leave you there. If you're His child, He will pursue you. But sometimes the pursuit can hurt, sometimes you will have to hurt before you can heal. And that's And and typically when God chases us, pursues us, he will do it in two different ways. When we're running from him and he's chasing us, he does it in two different ways. The first one is that he will keep from us the very thing that we want. If you're running and you want something else besides God, so he will keep from us that thing that we want. It could be a job, it could be a grade, it could be a promotion, it could be uh, a circumstance going a specific way, but God will keep that thing from you to protect you and not let you get to your destination so that you will continue to see that that is not the answer, but that God is the answer. The second option in which God chases us is actually much more terrifying. He will give to us the very thing that we want. That thing that we think will satisfy us, that thing that we think will give us joy, he'll give it to us. Because here's the deal. When Jonah wants to run to Tarshish, which is the opposite direction of Nineveh, there's a boat. There's a boat for him. There's a way for him to run away. And for us, you want to run to a specific sin, there will always be a boat. There will always be a boat. There will always be a way to get there. If you want to look at pornography, there is a way for you to look at it. And there are ways for you to hide it. If you want to be arrogant, there is always something to be arrogant about If you want to be jealous, there is always something for you to be jealous about. If you want to be prideful, there is always something to be prideful about. If you want to run to sin, there is always a boat for you to get there. And sometimes God will allow us 
to get to our destination until we realize that that destination was not what we thought it would be. Until that destination reveals to us that God is so much better than this thing. And so he gives, sometimes he will give us the very thing that we want until we realize that that thing is much less satisfying than our God. And here God sends a storm, a mighty storm, so much so that it threatened to break up. And God's means of grace here, think about this, God's means of grace here is not a conversation, but rather a messy, terrifying storm. And some of us feel that right now. Like you feel that storm all around you, and it hurts, and it's hard that you've been running, and there's a storm. Verse 5, it says, Then the mariners were afraid, and each cried out to his own God, and they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship and had laid down and was fast asleep. So when chaos is happening on the ship, Jonah is asleep. How? Well, think about it. Jonah's been running from God, and he knows it. And there's a trend, a word that is repeated purposely in these first several verses that gives us a glimpse, glimpse to how Jonah is doing. And it's the word down. Right? It's repeated several times. Jonah went down to Joppa. He paid the fare and went down. Jonah went down into the ship, and he laid down. As Jonah runs from God, his life begins to spiral down. You see it? It's purposely in there. As he runs from God, he, his life spirals down. And he's at the bottom of this ship, knowing that he's running away, and he's asleep. I think he's depressed. I think he realizes his mistake. I think he's, it's hurting him that he's running because he was not created to live apart from God. He was not created to run from God. He was created to live for the glory of God, to be fully satisfied in God and have that satisfaction unleashed to the nations for the purposes of God so that they could know who he is. And the other aspect of verses 5 through 6 that's interesting is the reaction of the sailors in the storm. Did you see it? We know from verse 4 that it's, an, like, it's a powerful storm, like so much so that the ship itself is threatening to break up. And based on the sailors' reaction... I would guess that the sailors have never seen a storm like this. The sailors are crying out to their own gods, but nothing happens. They're desperate. And what's interesting is that while they are crying out, where is Jonah? He's asleep. And I fear that that is an accurate metaphor for the church. That while the world is crying out for help, the church is inward focused. We are so focused on ourselves that we can't hear the cries for help. They're crying out to their own gods. Somebody help us. And the one who knows the answer for why all of this is happening is asleep at the bottom of the ship. He knows how to stop it, but he sleeps. The world is full of deceit, lies, pain. They manifest themselves in all sorts of different injustices from racism to slavery human trafficking, and we know, we know where satisfaction is found for these people. But we're too busy, inwardly focused, asleep. We're worried about what kind of music is played, how many chairs we need to set up. We can fight about so many different things with each other and completely miss the purpose of our creation, to live for the glory of God, to bring the gospel, that news that has changed us, to the world. But we go, oh, I don't like that. And we get so caught up in us that we forget them. And Jonah is caught up in himself. So verse 6, so the captain came and said to him, what do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, call out to your God. Perhaps the God will give a thought to us that we may not perish. So the call to arise comes from an unlikely source, the captain of the ship. And this is just sidebar. Sometimes God, or most of the time, God will use unlikely sources to wake you up. God will use things that you do not expect to wake you up. God uses this pagan captain to move the child of God 
into action. So in this moment, Jonah has a decision on whether or not he's going to stop running. And that's reality number three, that if we are going to stop running, we have to admit who we are and surrender. Verse 7, he said to one another, come, let us cast lots that we may know on whose account this evil has come upon us. So they cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. It's like rolling dice, like Jonah, right? Um, And they said to him, tell us on whose account this evil has come upon us. What is your occupation? Where do you come from? What is your country and what people are you? And he said to them, this is important, I am a Hebrew and I fear the Lord. And he uses the personal name for God, not Elohim, which is God, big God, powerful God, but the Lord, Yahweh, intimate, personal. And he says, I fear the Lord, the God of the heaven, the sea, and the dry land, the God of all things, but also the God who cares. And so they ask him, who are you running from? And he says, the God of the heaven and the sea and the dry land. And at that point, you have to wonder, if you're, if you're a sailor on that ship and you hear that this guy's running from the God of the sea, you have to be like, so you're running from the God of the sea on a boat? Like, really, bro? What are you, what are you thinking, right? And then it gets even weirder because in verse 10 it says, then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, what is it that you've done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Imagine what that conversation was like. He gets on the boat, they're like, hey, bro, where are you going? Or what are you doing? I'm just fleeing from the presence of the Lord, right? It probably was a strange conversation, but they, they heard it. They knew it. And so verse 11, then they said to him, what shall we do to you that the sea may quiet down for us? For the sea grew more and more powerful. He said to them, pick me up and hurl me into the sea that the sea will quiet down for you. For I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. And here in this moment, and we have to make the same decision, Jonah stops running. He does. He stops running and he surrenders his life to the Lord. It's a critical moment for Jonah and it's a critical moment for all of us in our our lives. When we look at what we're doing, the direction we're going, the sin that we're chasing, and we say, I'm done. I am done with it. Throw me overboard. Throw me to the Lord. That moment when we give up control, when we understand that we are not the author of our own lives. Verse 13 says, Nevertheless, the men rode hard to get back to dry land, but they could not, for the sea grew more and more stronger against them. Therefore, they called out to the Lord, O oh Lord, notice this, O oh Lord, let us not perish for this man's life and lay not on us innocent blood. For you, O oh Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah and hurled him to the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. And then it says, Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly, for they were exceedingly afraid. Now they, um, they were exceedingly afraid of the storm, and now they are exceedingly afraid of the Lord. And they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. Do you see what's happened? The central character of the story is Jonah. But because of what God does in and through Jonah's running, everyone gets to share in the love of God. Their all in wonder of the storm leads them to worship Jonah. There's a lesson here. What did Jonah do to teach them about God? Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. All he did was said, all this is happening because of me. He just admitted who he was. He was asleep at the bottom of the ship. But it was God himself who showed him to the sailors, and it was Jonah who revealed to them the source. That God can display all he wants. But God has ordained and purposed that the people of God reveal, through the Spirit, reveal who is the Almighty. And Jonah didn't do anything. He was running. But here's the other reality. No matter what your darkest day is or how far away you can run from God, God can use those moments. He can use those. There is not a dark moment or a moment in your life, a moment of suffering that is wasted. God will use every single one of them. And in this moment, when Jonah runs away, he uses it for his glory. He turns it 
As Jonah runs, he admits who he is. He comes back to God, and God uses it to save the men on the ship. God will use our darkest moments to lead people to know him more. Because here's the deal. He has a mission, and he will accomplish it. In a battle between your sin, think about this, in a battle between your sin and God's mission to bring people to know and love him more, your sin will never win. God's mission and God's purposes always will. Like, you are not strong enough to defeat God's purposes. <laughs> he will always win. And so, this is good news for us. Like, the mission of God is not up to you. God chooses to use you, but he will accomplish his purposes. So, act one of the story ends with a broken Jonah admitting who he is. In act two of the story, we will see God peace Jonah back together, but he isn't sitting in his apartment watching Netflix. He isn't just chilling at home. What happens? He's in the belly of a fish, and it's not easy. Verse 17, And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. So that's reality number four. After we admit and surrender who we are, there has to be a moment where we look towards the blood of Christ the washing of our sins. That's where we find hope. And here in chapter 2, it's interesting. So many times we just focus on the fact that he got swallowed by a fish, which is crazy enough, right? Some people say well, some people say fish. I don't know, it doesn't really matter, right? But that's what we focus on, right? We think about veggie tails, right? He got swallowed by a fish. But think about this. Before he got swallowed by the fish, what was happening? He almost drowned. He almost died. That before he experienced grace, he experienced the suffering. And that's hard. He says, I called out to the Lord and out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. All your waves and billows pass over me. The waters close in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeps, weeds were wrapped around my head. As Jonah thought he was about to die, what did he do? He prayed. He prayed. And not only did he pray, but here's the crazier part. God answered. But he did not answer in the way that he expected to, which, newsflash, God rarely does. He rarely answers in the way that we expect him to. God answers with the fish. And in that place, in the belly of that fish, he is able to gain perspective and understanding. Twice, you will see Jonah look towards the temple. In verse 4 and verse 7. Then I said, I am driven away from your sight, yet I shall look again upon your holy temple. Then verse 7, when my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord. And my prayer came to you and to your holy temple. Why is he doing that? Why is he looking towards the temple. Why is a guy stuck in the belly of a fish thinking about the temple in Jerusalem? That when Jonah realizes that he might die, he gains perspective and understanding. He begins to think about what matters. For Jonah, it's the coming Messiah. See, the temple was in Jerusalem. And the Jews believed that Jerusalem was the center of the world. And in the center of the temple in Jerusalem was a room known as the Holy of Holies. And in the middle of that room was a box. And in that box were all the rules that God had told us to keep. Because it was believed that God's holiness dwelt in this room. And the only way that we could be in the presence of God, which dwelt in that room, was if we could keep the rules that were in that box. So in order to be in that room, we had to say, I've kept all the rules. I'm perfect. I have no blemish, no sin. Which is impossible. No one can do that. There's a catch. On the top of that box is something called the mercy seat. And the mercy seat was believed to be, this is where God meets his people. And once a year, a priest would enter that room with blood drained from an innocent lamb, it would drain that, and they would spread that blood on the lid of that box, the mercy seat. And the idea was this, that when God looks at that box, he doesn't see all the rules that we can't keep. But instead, he sees what? 
the blood of something innocent covering it. So I want you to think about this. That thing that you did that you never thought you would do, the sin that you run to, if you are in Christ, he doesn't see all the rules that you have not kept. He sees the blood of an innocent God, his son. And on the basis of that, you are counted righteous. You are counted holy. He doesn't see the things that you haven't done right. He sees Jesus, his son, covering your sin. So Jonah, in the belly of that fish, thinks about that. That he's been running. But the basis of his action going forward is that I will look towards the temple. God, when you see me, you don't see my running but you see the blood of the innocent lamb shed for me. So our prayers, they're not based on the rules that we can't keep. It's not based on us trying to earn God's approval. It's based on the blood of Jesus covering our sin and making us new. It's the gospel, and it's our only hope. And so Jonah ends his prayer in verse 9, but I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you What I have vowed, I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. And verse 10, and the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah up onto the dry land. Cool. Um, Reality number five. God is a God of second chances. Look at Jonah 3.1. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Praise God. The word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time. Time saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against the message that I tell you. So, verse 3, Jonah arose, and he did what? He went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Notice that the, the call doesn't change. Like, because Jonah screwed up, God didn't go, Okay, let me do something less for you. Let me make this not as hard. Or let me take some responsibility from you. No, no, no. God keeps the same call. He doesn't lessen it. He doesn't give Jonah less because of his failure. His call is the same that it was in chapter 1, that there are many of us in this room that have fell into the trap of thinking that because of our failures, God cannot use us, or he cannot use us as much. And in the Bible, that is as far from the truth as you can get, as you think about every single character, from David to Abraham to Paul to, uh, to Jonah to to. Uh, Moses, like you just go down the list and find me a person that did not mess up, but that God used greatly. God is a God of second chances that in the Bible, he continually uses those who run from him. And he pursues them and he grabs them and he turns them and unleashes them towards his mission, his purposes, his glory. So many times when we think our story is over, God's just getting started. He is. Look what happens in Jonah's story. Jonah 3, verses 4 and 5, he says, Jonah began to go into the city going a day's journey, and he called out, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They called for a fast and put on sackcloth, from the greatest of them to the least of them. Like, think about this. This is one of the greatest revivals, accomplishments, and missions in the history of the world. And it takes what? In ESV version, eight words. <laughs> That's crazy. It's the greatest, one of the greatest movements of God in the world, in the history of everything. The entire nation repents. And here's the deal. God could have just said to Jonah, look, bro, I'm done with you. You are messed up, okay? Um, he could have. He could have just forgotten about Jonah, left him on the ship, um, and put it, given his call to somebody else, but he wasn't done with Jonah. And he's not done with you either. He's not done with you. Reality number six, surrendering to God does not mean that you will not struggle, because the book takes another turn, right? Jonah 4.1, but it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. At the beginning of this chapter, we see Jonah angry and upset, which, when you think about it, doesn't make much sense because Jonah was just the catalyst for one of the greatest revivals in the history of 
the world. So why is Jonah exceedingly angry? Verse 2 tells us. And he prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to Tarshish, for I knew that you are gracious, God, and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love, and relenting from disaster. I want you to notice something. When God's grace was extended to Jonah in chapter 2, it produced thanksgiving. So when his grace was extended to him in the belly of the fish, it produced thanksgiving. But when God's grace is extended to the people of Nineveh, it produced anger and bitterness. God, may it not be so for us. May we not gladly receive the grace of God when it's for us, but be angry and bitter when it goes to those who we don't like. May we not be so inward focused that we will joyfully receive God's grace when it helps us, but then alienate the rest of the world or a group of people that we don't like and be angry when God does something in their life. That is what Jonah's angry about. He'll gladly receive it when it's for him, but when it's for someone else that's different than him, he doesn't like it. It's almost like looking in the face of God and saying, I knew you would show your love for them. I knew you would love them. That's why I didn't say anything. That's why I didn't do anything. So let's break this down. What is it that Jonah really wants out of this? So think about it. Assyria is an evil place, the greatest representation of evil during Jonah's time, and one of the greatest representations of evil during any time. And not only that, Assyria Assyria had attacked his people and killed many of them. So what does Jonah want? I think, I think Jonah wants justice. I do. I think Jonah wants justice, that in this moment, Jonah is unable to connect the justice of God and the love of God. He can't put the two together. So don't be too quick to judge Jonah in this moment. We have the same struggle. That's why it's in the Bible, right? His struggle is the same as many of us, that when we see some, someone do something to someone that we love, something unthinkable, we get angry. And in our anger, we want justice. We want them to pay for what they have done. And when we look at the world through those eyes, it's really hard to understand why God loves them. We want them to pay, and we can have a tendency to think that God should only give his love to those who deserve it, but that statement has a false pretense. You are assuming that someone deserves God's love. You're assuming that you deserve God's love, right? You're assuming that you have earned it. In the reality, in the eyes of God, we all deserve the wrath of God for the things that we've done. The essence of the evil act does not matter because God sees all sin as evil. The love of God is not for people who deserve it. That person doesn't exist, but it's for people who don't deserve it who, and understand that they don't deserve it. It's called grace. Jonah can't grasp the justice and grace of God. Nineveh didn't deserve God's love, but he gave it because that's who God is. When a repenting people cry out to God, God responds with mercy. Verse 3, Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, Do you do well to be angry? Jonah went out of the city and set to the east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade till he should see what would become of the city. Consider this. Jonah just witnessed the greatest revival in the history of humanity. And now we have a city that is probably trying to figure out what it means to follow God. And the only man that can lead them is sitting on top of a hill hoping for their destruction. The irony. Well, what's his issue? I think it's entitlement. He wants God's wrathful justice. He wants God's wrathful justice because he feels entitled. Jonah has served God his entire life, and he feels like God should be on his side. However, and this is true, that we need to know this, I need to know this, God is on God's side. 
and he always been. And God cannot change who he is. No matter what it do, when it comes to what we want and the love of God, if those two things are at odds, God's loves and purposes always win. Jonah's motives are not lined up with the purposes of God. They're not. Therefore, he does not understand why God does the things he does. Does that make sense? That was pretty wordy. Does that make sense? It's the same with us. If our motives are not lined up with who God is, then we will not understand why God does the things that he does. If our motives are not lined up. If we feel entitled because we've been a follower of Christ for this long, or we've done this for God, and we've done this, like if we come with that kind of attitude, then the moment that something happens in our life that we don't agree with, then we will react in frustration. We will. It's crucial to understand that as children of God, God is for us, but even more, God is for God. And here's the deal. We, we shouldn't want it any other way. We shouldn't. I don't want God to bend to my Will, I don't want God to be more like me because my will is corrupt and your will is corrupt. My will is not pure. His will is pure. God is holy and perfect. I am not. So I do not want him to bend to me. I want to bend to him. Jonathan Edwards once said, if we knew the things that God knew, we would do exactly the same thing. Verse 6. Now the Lord God appointed a plant and made it come up over Jonah that it might be a shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant. What's the deal with the plant? To Jonah, the plant is a moment of comfort and distraction. It makes him good about his current situation and distracts him from what's happening around him. We all have these things. Things that as the storm is going around us and things aren't going our way, we have these creature comforts that distract us from what's actually happening. It could be a phone, it could be video games, it could be TV, I just put it, it could be whatever. But Jonah has experienced a creature comfort that distracts him from what's actually happening. It's numbing him to the things that's happening. Verse 7, but when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God appointed a scorching east wind And the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint. And he asked that he might die and said, it is better for me to die than to live. Jonah is not willing to address the root issue of his anger. So what does God do? He removes the distraction. Not only did he make a worm eat the plant that was comforting him, but he sent a scorching wind and put the sun down on his head. God will do whatever it takes to get our attention. He will do whatever it takes to get our attention, to save us from the destination that will destroy us and run to him. Verse 9, but God said to Jonah, do you, well do, do you do well to be angry for the plant? And he said, yes, I do well to be angry, angry enough to die. And the Lord said, you pitied the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should not I pity Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know the right hand from the left, and also much cattle. Here, Jonah advocates for something to be saved, but it's a plant. And it's meant to be ironic. Jonah has more concern for a plant than for an entire nation, 120,000 people. And when it says those who don't know their right hand from their left, that's an idiom for saying that these people are morally and spiritually unaware. They, They don't know. They don't have a leader. And why does God mention cattle? I always wondered that. Um, Well, here's the deal. If Jonah will not allow God to have compassion on Nineveh for the sake of 120,000 people whom God created and cares for, will Jonah not also allow God to have compassion on Nineveh for the sake of the animals? (laughs) Since, after all, Jonah was willing to have compassion on a plant, he's not willing to have compassion on a group of animals. That's why cattle is mentioned. And the story here, this story doesn't end with the happily ever after. Instead, the story ends with a haunting question, a question from God, and it's meant to be left unanswered. And we have to answer it for ourselves. I'll rephrase the question like this very simply. Does your heart 
match God's heart? Does your heart match God's heart? Are you only willing to receive God's love when it's for you? Are those that are like you? Or are you willing to receive and share God's love to all? There are two things that I want to point out from the book of Jonah. The first one is this. In the book of Jonah, we see the sovereignty of God and the disobedience of man. Now, don't be overwhelmed by that word sovereign. When you hear that, think power, authority, control. In the book of Jonah, God has power and authority over everything. When he commands, that thing obeys. So when he commands something, that thing obeys. Chapter 1-4, the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea. Verse 17, the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. Chapter 2, the Lord spoke to the fish and it vomited Jonah up out of land. So God says vomit and something vomits. Chapter 4, verse 6, the Lord appointed a plant. Verse 7, God appointed a worm. Verse 8, God appointed a scorching east wind. Do you see it? God has authority over the movement of the wind and the movement of worms. He has authority over it all. And every single one of those things obeys without question. Now here's the deal. What's the contrast to the book of Jonah? The only thing that disobeys God is the person of God. It's the man of God. Everything obeys without question except us. It's meant to sting and it's meant to hurt and reveal to us how deep the stain of our sin goes. Because worms were created for God's glory. Wind was created for God's glory. The things in this story were created for God's glory. We were created for God's glory, but we are the only thing that rebels. And that's supposed to hurt, because that's not the way it was intended to be. And the second thing I'll put out about the book of Jonah is that the pursuit of God's child is consistent from beginning to end. God never stops pursuing Jonah. Chapter 1, Jonah runs to Tarshish and God pursues. Chapter 4, Jonah runs to a hill and God pursues. At no point does God give up on Jonah. He doesn't. And here's the deal. He hasn't given up on you either. And when you run, which you will, God will pursue you. In fact, the book ends with God still pleading with Jonah. Think about that. He's still pleading. He still hasn't given up on Jonah. And you need to know that God is pursuing you. He is. God is pursuing you each and every day. You may feel like you are unworthy and that no one is reaching out to you. No one is caring for you. No one cares about what you think or what you feel or what you're going through. But you need to know that in this moment, God is pursuing you. He wants you. If you are in Christ, you, you would say, I, I believe that Jesus has died for my sins and he is pursuing you. And if you're not in Christ, he is pursuing you so that you can see just how much better he is than the world. And I'll say this too, for those of us, because there's some of us, you're not really running from God, you're, you're okay. You're pursuing God. But there's some of us in here who are carrying the burden of a family member, a brother, or sister, a husband or a wife, um, a friend, a son, or a daughter who is running and running hard. And I want to encourage you that you would know and believe that God is pursuing them. So what do we do? I think we pray like Jonah did in the belly of the fish. I think we sing. And I think we take a breath, right? Like take a breath to really consider the reality that God is pursuing us. Like, slow down. When Jonah's running, he, can get, he gets so overwhelmed, and he goes down into the ship, and his life begins to spiral down. But what I would want for you in this moment is to just stop, breathe, and remember the truth of the Word of God. That You have a God who cares for you. You have a God that sent his Son for you, and so you can slow, you can slow down. And, not, and stop trying to find satisfaction in things that will not give it. And you know that in the back of your mind. That you would just stop, admit who you are, and surrender. Because it's in that place that you will find hope.